Good morning. When Tom asked me to say a few words about burnout this morning, I had to think a little bit about how I might share this topic with you all. When about seven or eight years ago at my old job, I personally got burned out. At the time, I was a researcher studying things like teamwork and leadership, and when those things break down, what the consequences can be. Then the levels of burnout in society got so high that a bigger contributing factor to all kinds of outcomes than the leadership that people experienced and the teamwork and the collaboration and the coordination that they experienced with their fellow human beings kind of paled in comparison to just the burnout level of the people in the group. That became a much bigger factor uh, in outcomes. So I became fascinated with burnout myself. I dare I say I even became obsessed with it. I now, I now do quite a bit of research on it, uh, and that's pretty much what I do about 98% of my time in my job is to study this. And I want to share a little bit about how this relates uh, to us as you use here today. So I want to start off by saying, for those of us who were in the I'm with her crowd this year, we're going to have a long four years ahead, uh, but that's okay. We can do it because as you use, we have some unique strengths and those strengths can really help to push us through these next four years. And I'll give you a hint right now. It has to do with our connections to each other. So let me start off by saying what is burnout and what is resilience? We'll talk a little bit about what we know about the importance of connecting to others. And then finally, we'll end with a little bit of a warmth of community checklist, some, maybe some to-dos that you might be interested in considering. So what is burnout? <clears throat> well, burnout and resilience, human resilience, are really two sides of the same coin. Just like you can be tall or you can be short, you can be burned out, you can be resilient. Those two things kind of meet in the middle somewhere where it's actually neither burnout nor resilience. If you experienced severe burnout or severe political exhaustion on election night, I want you to know that you are not insane. You are only awake. And similarly, if you refilled your bucket during the Women's March with the light of truth and the warmth of community and the fire of commitment, there too you are awake. Burnout is also known as emotional exhaustion and compassion fatigue. It's what you think it is, basically. As your demands in your life go up, and your resources go down, it creates a strain. This can be spiritual, financial, cognitive, physical, emotional, political. But as the demands go up and the resources go down, the longer you're asked to sustain that disconnect, the more burned out you become. It's very simple. It's not a human failing to be burned out. It's a factor of the situation, basically, that you find yourself in. So what is resilience then? If we talked a little bit about burnout. Resilience is the ability to kind of bounce back after adversity. More generally, it's the ability to cope. It's, part of it is your ability to cope, but a bigger part of it is the availability and the accessibility of resources that you have related to health and well-being around you. The first person to study resilience, and he coined the term, was Norman Gormezzi. He was a developmental psychologist and a clinician at the University of Minnesota who met thousands of children in his four decades of research. But there was one boy who particularly stuck in his mind. He was nine years old. 
He had an alcoholic mother and a completely absent father, but each day he would arrive at school with the exact same sandwich. Two slices of bread with nothing between. At home, there was no other food available and no one to make any. And even so, the boy wanted to make sure that no one would feel pity for him and no one would know the ineptitude of his mother. Each day without fail, he would walk in with a smile on his face and a bread sandwich tucked into his bag. The people who study burnout have learned some interesting consequences and some interesting predictors of what leads to burnout. There's a colleague of mine in Switzerland named Renzo Bianchi who does what I think are really interesting gaze tracking studies where you follow the pupils of someone when you put an image in front of them. You can put a collage of a whole bunch of different images and scenes, pictorial descriptions in front of someone, and then track what are they looking at as they scan through these scenes. Some of these scenes could be positive images, people that are happy, laughing, good things are happening. Some of these scenes could be neutral. Some of them uh, can be quite negative. People who are crying, they're injured, or they're about, or they're afraid. And what he found was very interesting. People who are burned out, people who are emotionally exhausted, when you track what they look at in the pictures, they skip over the positive scenes and they skip over the neutral scenes. And like a laser beam, they go straight to the negative scenes. And when you ask them afterwards, what did you see in these images? They can describe in stunning detail everything that they saw in the negative scenes, but they can't recall the positive or the neutral ones. There's a reason for this. When you are being chased by a predator, a saber-toothed tiger, and you're running, running for your life, trying to escape a threat... If you're focused on the negative that's in front of you, you can avoid those as well and still escape the threat behind you. So when you're in escape mode, which is what burnout is, you're not looking for the good things in life. You're actually afraid and you're looking for the negative. In fact, if you were running from a predator and you stop to say, my goodness, look at that rainbow. (laughs) I'm afraid you won't be passing your genes on to your children. (laughs) So a focus on the negative has survival value. It has survival value, but it doesn't help us with our happiness. One of the hallmarks of resilient people is that they're able to match their current emotion to the current situation very well. They're able to calibrate. These aren't people who pretend. They're not saying everything is fine all the time. If it sucks, they say, this really sucks right now. And if it's good, they say, this is a good moment. A resilient person, when they get halfway through a delicious sandwich, will say, oh, man, I'm so thankful that I've got another half of this sandwich. (laughs) But they can pause and take in those micro moments. Resilient people calibrate their current emotion to the current situation accurately. If you are laughing hysterically, at a funeral, or if you're crying uncontrollably when your child brings you a new drawing, you're holding on to an old emotion that isn't appropriate for the current situation. In psychology, we call that pathology. That's what pathology is, when you're holding on to an old emotion that isn't appropriate to the current situation. This is what we do when we're burned out. So just to give you a sense 
of how, of how very common this is. Can we do a little activity in the sanctuary? So I'd like to t- take a little poll. Let's just look at how common burnout is in the congregation. And to do this, uh, we have to all rise in body and spirit. If you're at willing and able, all rise. We'll do a little vote. Now, are, are you all familiar with the comedian Jeff Foxworthy? You know this guy? He gives you the hallmarks for being a redneck. The, what are the criteria for being a redneck? He says things like, You ever find yourself staring at a carton of orange juice? Because it's a concentrate. You might be a redneck. You know that guy? <laughs> what I'd like to do is to give you the hallmarks of burnout in the in the general population. And if you, and I'm going to get, there are seven of these, and as I read them out, if you hear one of these hallmarks of burnout that really resonates with you, I simply ask that you vote with your butt and you have a seat, right? (laughs) I see how long you can stay up. Number one, hallmarks of burnout in the general population. Number one, you just might be burned out if... You try to be everything to everyone. If that's you, find your chair. You try to be everything to everyone. Now, there's a quarter of the room, 25% of you right now, wanted to sit down, but you really want to hear what comes next on the list. Don't worry, you'll have your chance to sit in a minute. Number two, you just might be burned out if you get to the end of a hard day and you feel like you have not made a meaningful difference. If that's you, find your chair. (laughs) Number three, you just might be burned out if you feel like the effort that you put in is not recognized. The effort that you put in is not recognized. Find your chair. Now for those of you who are already seated, if you hear another one that really resonates, you can pop up and pop back down. (laughs) Or many people at this point just opt to lie on the floor. That's <laughs> perfectly within reason. Number four, you just might be burned out if you identify so strongly with work that you lack a reasonable balance between your work and your personal life. If that's you, find your chair. Number five, You just might be burned out if your work varies between monotony and chaos. Varies between monotony and chaos. Some people say, I wish I had some monotony. It's just chaos all the time. (laughs) Number six, you just might be burned out if you feel you have little or no control over your work that you're doing. You have little or no control. Got some jack-in-the-boxes on that one. And then number seven, you just might be burned out if you are an open-minded Unitarian Universalist. (laughs) In the United States... Right now, 20 to 34% of adults, 18 and older, are experiencing burnout or emotional exhaustion right now. It's associated with high demands and low control, a lack of social support, and this one, so listen up, disagreeing about values inside and outside of the workplace also leads to emotional exhaustion. Can you think of anyone with whom you might disagree with about things that are important to you? (laughs) In this age of alternative facts (laughs) and fake news, our UU openness can make our moods vulnerable to negative emotions like fear 
and anger. In non-dogmatic contexts where evangelical views are relatively uncommon, a personal sense of spirituality is positively associated with openness. That's the people in the sanctuary right now, except for Bill Petit. (laughs) In evangelical and highly religious contexts, personal spirituality is positively associated with being agreeable, and it's negatively associated with openness. So you're friendly, but you're close-minded. This openness that we experience as you use is not new, historically speaking, for more than four centuries. The Romanian Transylvanian Unitarian Church has stood as a symbol of liberal faith and openness. In the year 1568, the first ever edict of religious toleration in history was declared during the reign of the first and only Unitarian king, John Sigismund. His court preacher, who is Francis David, famously said, We need not think alike to love alike. We need not think alike to love alike. This reminds me of our current day, whoever you are, wherever you're from, whomever you love, you are welcome here. You can't, I can't say that right now anymore without Eric, Eric Bannon's uh, soundtrack in my head. You are welcome here. This is the openness and community that we share here at the community church. At the community church. But before we talk more about the warmth of community, let's take a look at this sense of connection writ large. The importance of connecting with others. We are not talking about being pretend. We're not talking about people being bright, shiny, happy people all the time. In fact, in our research lab, we have a word for this. If you go around all the time saying, I'm fine, I'm fine. No, really, I'm fine. I'm fine. We call that dropping the (laughs) F-bomb. You're probably not fine. Also, as a caveat, people who value happiness to an extreme find that it backfires. And if you try to suppress your own negative emotion, that also backfires. This is about being able to access positive emotion and good mood when it fits the situation. And there are 10 of these positive emotions that can be so very powerful for us to hold on to. There's joy, which is kind of cheerfulness writ large. There's gratitude or feeling appreciative toward another person or another thing. There's serenity or having a sense of peace around you. There's interest or being engaged, curious about the world. There's hope. Hope springs eternal even when times are bleak. You think to yourself, wow, there could be a brighter day. There's pride, which allows you to Dream big. If I can do this, what else could I do? There's amusement. Amusement is like joy in stereo, where you have a shared sense of something that might be humorous with another person. There's inspiration, which is a wonderful positive emotion. It can be from things that are academic or spiritual or people who show physical prowess in the Olympics, you know, can be inspiring. There's awe. Awe and wonder is a really powerful Emotion. It makes your perception of time slow down when you pause and you look up at the stars or you gaze over the rim at the Grand Canyon. It's a powerful emotion. And then then there's love, which is kind of all of the above. Now, what makes these positive emotions so special is when you experience them in stereo. It's when You are experiencing them in the presence of and with another person. It's that connection to another person that amplifies the positive emotion. 
There's a famous psychologist at UNC Chapel Hill named Barb Fredrickson, who's one of the world's leading psychologists, one of the most cited psychologists in the world. And she says, flourishing, thriving, is not a solo human endeavor. So our relationships are central to our lives. There's nothing people consider more meaningful and essential to their mental and physical well-being than their close relationships with other people. It's in the company of others that we often experience pleasure, and it's certainly how we best savor its aftermath. And it's with other people that we work, we love, and we play. Good relationships with other people may be a necessary condition for our own happiness. And perhaps, not surprisingly, research shows that people experience more of these positive emotions when interacting with other people than when we're alone. The warmth of community amplifies and extends those positive emotions that we need. Being part of a meaningful social interaction has a whole host of very important benefits. Not only is it good for your well-being, people who experience more positive connection also have lower rates of anxiety, lower rates of depression, lower rates of cardiovascular disease, and overall better immune system function. In fact, if you look at an interesting study from Carnegie Mellon, they demonstrated a link between social connections and physical health. And in this study, they gave undergraduate freshmen the flu vaccine. And they found that the levels of participant loneliness, these students, the ones that were low on loneliness before they got the vaccine versus medium versus high on loneliness, those participants who were lonely had a much less robust immune response to the vaccine. They produced fewer antibodies. Their body was ready to create antibodies at a smaller rate than those who were not lonely. All of them got the vaccine, but the least lonely folks had the healthiest immune response, whereas the loneliest students had the weakest. Interestingly, did you know that this idea of feeling rejected or not accepted, in particular social rejection, is experienced in the same part of the brain as physical pain? In fact, you can take a Tylenol and reduce the experience of social rejection. So powerful is the physiology. And in these studies... None of these outcomes were associated with the size of your social network. It's not how many friends you have. It's how often you have access to some meaningful connection with at least another person. In a recent meta-analysis, which is a study of a whole bunch of different studies. This one had 148 different published studies in it. They found that you have a 50% increased chance of longevity, of, of living longer, if you have meaningful social connections. This finding is consistent across age and sex and initial health status and cause of death. It's such a powerful finding that we now view not having friends as a risky health behavior. It's riskier than your smoking status. It is riskier than whether or not you drink alcohol. And it's riskier than your physical activity level and your body mass index. It's pretty powerful. Similarly, as you heard during Joys and Sorrows, more and more people are living beyond 100 years now. And there's an interesting 
set of research studies being done on this. They're called Blue Zones, areas of the world. The founder of this, uh, at Blue Zone, Dan Butner, has identified these longevity hotspots where there are disproportionate numbers of centurions, people who live to be 100 years old or older. They're in Okinawa and Sardinia, in places like Loma Linda, California, where they have Seventh-day Adventists. And in the research that they've done on these places where you tend to live longer, they found five common threads. Yes, there's don't smoke. Yes, there's stay physically active. Yes, there's eat a largely plant-based diet, but the top two predictors, number one, put family first, and number two, stay socially engaged. So other people matter. Other people matter a lot. What can we do about this? How do we go about supercharging the warmth of community? Thank heavens there are great studies that provide some useful insights here. <laughs> Research shows that it's not the number of connections, but the frequency with which you have tiny, meaningful connections. I'll tell you what these to-dos are for your warmth of community checklist, if you will. Random acts of kindness, getting and giving support, self-disclosure to others, prioritizing meaningful connections with other people, and expressing gratitude. So we'll start with random acts of kindness. Did you know that the amount of money that you spend on yourself has no link to your happiness whatsoever? But there is such a thing as retail therapy. Uh, <laughs> The amount of money that we spend on other people has a linear relationship with our happiness. The more we spend on others, the more our mood improves. If you don't believe me as you're driving on the interstate, pay the toll for somebody driving behind you and then drive off like a bat out of hell and say, ha ha ha, they'll never know who I was. And notice what happens to your mood when you're doing that. <laughs> There's even some evidence that we are wired. We are hardwired for kindness. When we give to others or when we act cooperatively, the reward centers of our brain, like the nucleus accumbens, which is a region that's dense with dopamine receptors, this stuff hums with activity. So when we are giving to others, we're actually getting something out of that. You can do all kinds of acts of kindness. Pay a compliment to another person. Leave a kind sticky note. Tidy up a mess that you didn't make. Buy a coffee or dessert for a friend. Give money to someone in need. Listen to someone who's struggling. Praise the efforts of others. Let someone in a hurry in front of you on the interstate or hold the elevator door. Or you can donate to a building expansion near you. <laughs> Research also shows that getting and giving social support is a powerful, powerful contributor to our resilience. Keeps burnout at bay. In fact, the research even shows that giving social support to other people is more beneficial to us than receiving social support from other people. Another thing that we can do is a little bit of self disclosure, show a little bit of vulnerability. Brene Brown, a wonderful sociologist who's done TED Talks and written great books on this. There are a few social workers in the audience and I probably know about her. Uh, she says that vulnerability is at the core, the center of human experience. So another simple thing that we can do in our interactions is just be authentic when we're interacting and perhaps even a little bit vulnerable. Now I'm not talking about oversharing, okay? 
there is such a thing as giving too much information. This isn't about trying to befriend a workplace bully or fix a difficult relationship. Rather, it's about taking advantage of naturally occurring moments of connection. A few weeks ago, my friend James asked me how I was doing, which he does every week. And I told him it was, I was doing better after a difficult spell. And he said, do you mind if I ask what it is that's going better? And in that two-minute conversation with my friend, it made me feel a deeper connection to the church and a deeper connection to my friend James. The fourth thing we can do is to prioritize our connections, our meaningful connections to others. You know, it doesn't just happen on its own. You have to schedule it. You have to make it happen. You can't say, this week I want to have more fun, or this week I want to enjoy myself more, or I want to be happy. Instead, you say, this Wednesday after dinner, I'm going to take a walk with Margaret. Or this Thursday at 10.30 in the morning, I'm going to have a coffee with Bruce. Things that make a difference. You can have discussions at the dinner table that involve asking others how they're doing. Can you name three things that went well today? You can learn one thing that your spouse or your friend is going to be doing the next day and then check in with them to see how that went. You can aim to have one positive interaction with a stranger each day, a store clerk or an elevator buddy. You can call or text a friend or a family member just to send your well wishes. Don't ask for any favors, just send kind thoughts. And then lastly, one of my favorite things you can do is to express gratitude to other people. William Ward said that feeling gratitude and not expressing it is like wrapping a present and not giving it. So make your gratitude potent. Don't just say thank you. Say, I really appreciate what you did because, and here's what that says about you. And that strengthens our bonds. So the take-homes are random acts of kindness, getting, and in particular, giving social support. Self-disclosure and vulnerability a little bit goes a long way. Don't go too much. Don't go too far on the vulnerability front. <laughs> Prioritizing connections with others and expressing gratitude. Putting the you back in thank you. This is why I'm thanking you. And in closing, I just want to make it very clear that the research doesn't lie Burnout is normal. It is a normal human reaction to an abnormal situation. And our openness and our desire for community are key ingredients to increasing meaningful connection through the warmth of that community. And there's a ripple effect. Just like burnout from other people can be contagious and can pull us down. You know, your drama now becomes my boat anchor and now I'm sinking. So is resilience of other people something that can lift you up. Your efforts to engage in more warmth of community have these positive ripples in the lives of others. There's a strong scientific basis for what we call the grace and sacredness in the words, the light of truth and the warmth of community and the fire of commitment and all of which we carry in our hearts until we are together again. Just as we know that for your resilience, other people matter, we also know that for the resilience of others, you matter. Blessed be.